I have a special message for fathers today. As we celebrate this Father's Day, we go to Matthew chapter 6 as we study the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray that begins with those words, Our Father. Amazing words of hope, amazing words of promise that we bring to our experience that we have a Father who loves us. And the ninth sentence, the ninth phrase of this great prayer that Jesus taught us to pray is what we're looking at today, what we're thinking about this morning as we hear the phrase of the praise at the end of this great prayer. Three simple words. And the power. <laughs> the praise that ends this great prayer reminds us where the strength and wisdom and ability of the universe comes from. The word power itself is an interesting word, and it's used to describe the cause and effect that our actions might have on the reality or the circumstances around us. The ability we have to change our reality or the circumstances around us. The word power itself is not a possession. It's something that we have the ability to do. And if you look around the world, human beings have been given the responsibility to be the steward of God's creation here on earth. We have been given the power and the authority through the abilities we've been given to be in charge. So on this Father's Day, as we recognize God's power over all things, let's examine how we're doing with the power that God's given us. So if you want to take a look around the world with me today, let's take an inventory on how we're doing. And then as we look at the whole world, let's go back just a little bit and, and focus in. Let's pretend we're on Google Earth together. We've got the planet in view. Now we focus in on our country and then focus in on our state and then focus in on our city, and then focus in on our community, and then focus in on our own families, and finally, ourselves. Put that little red dot right over you, and say, how am I doing this morning with the things that God has given me the ability to change? The cause and effect of my own actions, and my own thoughts, and my own words. Specifically, as men this morning, one of the things that we're always looking for is more power. I'm so sure of that that I'm going to illustrate that to you this morning in just a moment with a video clip. There was a show that was on a number of years ago called Home Improvement. And Tim, the tool man Taylor, had one goal, and that was to make everything he had have more power. And in this video clip, he shows you what you can do with a lawnmower and a jet engine. Please take a look. Tim, uh, this is the proper tool. Yeah, I bet it is, Al. You know, men, we want a job done right and we want it done quick. What do we need? More power! Darn right, more power. So riding lawnmower with a jet engine off a Chinook helicopter. <laughs> your mind you put a jet engine on a lawnmower what is that just a little old engine bob <laughs> gentlemen start your engines Shit! But I gotta 
things don't always work out the way we want them to, the way we think of when we think about the word power. Because as you look around the world, one of the greatest problems with the world is not the ability we have to help each other and the power we have to encourage and strengthen each other, but rather the power that we use to hurt each other and create chaos in this world. So there's three myths about power that I want to speak to this morning. Three things that we think of as men so many times that are not true. And the first myth is that I am the source of my power. When you are looking at the bookstores of America, or you're looking online at the ways in which people will teach you how to be a better person, most often they will point you to the abilities and strengths that you have and say that is the source of your ability to do better. That you, on your own strength and on your own power and your own ability, can make the difference that you need to make. So whatever it is that you're facing, whatever problems that you have, whatever circumstances you may be dealing with, if you can just connect to your own power, then you can change your life and make a difference. That everything about what you can do and what you accomplish is up to you. And that if you will just try harder, work harder, think more positively, or whatever it might be, what you can do is what can affect change. That you are the source of everything good that can happen. And that if you don't change, and you don't do something different, then the only way that anything good is going to happen is if you do it. And I want to tell you this morning that that is very attractive to a lot of people. Because I don't want to have to depend on anybody else for my strength or my source of power. I want to be in charge of my own strength. I want to be in charge of my own power. And if I'm the source of my power, then I can take credit for the results. As men, so many times we think of ourselves dependent on how we can change or affect change in the world around us. So if we're men of great wealth, we derive our self-worth from our ability to use our resources to control the circumstances around us. If we're men of great talent, we use our talents to influence and affect change through our ability to influence others and derive our self-worth from our own power to do that. And I would like to say that that is not just true for men, it's also true for women as well. But we have this idea as we look around the world that somehow we're in charge of what happens. That we are the source of what affects change in the world. And I want to point to the myth of that by talking about my second myth, and that is this. Power is permanent. That's a myth. Power is never permanent. Power is constantly changing. Energy is constantly diffusing. Look at the stars at night that we're seeing as the night sky beams those beams of light across the eons of the centuries of light years it's taken for that light to get here. The light that's expressed in that power is no longer the same as when it began. As a matter of fact, as it crossed its vast journey through space, it's actually not even where it was when that light first began to shine because as we know for the time it takes for that light to get here, those stars have moved to a completely different spot in the night sky. And the millions of years it will take for that light to reach us that it's shining now will show us a completely different version of the night sky than we see right now. Power is never permanent. It's constantly transforming, constantly changing, 
constantly diffusing, and constantly slowing down to final entropy. We strive so hard to reach for those things we cannot ultimately control and sacrifice our lives and our time for power that will not last. Jesus is teaching us how to pray in this prayer. He's talking to us about what it means to recognize where our source of power comes from. And he reminds us at the end of this prayer that it's not our power, it's God's power. We can use the words thine and yours interchangeably in this sentence, and instead of saying, and the power, say, yours is the power. Because the sentence that begins this word of praise says, for yours is the kingdom, and then continues on in that same phrase, and the power. So yours is the power. God, you are the one who is the permanent source of power. The initial cause of everything that there is. And the one who makes everything possible. It's a myth to think that any power we possess is permanent. And then the final myth that I want to briefly talk about this morning is I am what I have the power to do. That's a myth. You are not what you have the power to do. Now, why is that a myth? Because before time began, before we can even imagine anything being created, our Heavenly Father knew who we were. Now, I can't even get my mind around that. If you can help me get your mind, and we can get our minds together and get our minds around that, I, I'll, you're doing better than me. But I am so much more than what I have the power to do because of my initial creative source and how God created me to begin with and what he's created me to do, not anybody else. I have that power that comes from the source of all power, regardless of anything I can accomplish or anything I can do. I didn't create myself to be eternal. That's a power that comes from way beyond anything I have the ability to do or to accomplish. So that means that my self-worth does not come from what I have the ability to do. My self-worth comes from the fact that I have a good father. And he knows who I am. And he loves me. And he's the source of everything that I can ever become. If I am what I have the power to do, then so many times I fall short. Because so many times I use the abilities God has given me in ways that I should not. And there are times when I do my very best and I fail. And if I bring my self-worth to the table based on what I have the ability to do, I'm never going to be happy with who I am. I'm never going to have joy in my heart about who God has created me to do because I'm always going to be comparing myself to everyone else around me and their ability or even thinking about my own failures. Let me give you a little sentence to illustrate this final myth. Comparison is the death of self-contentment. Comparison is the death of self-contentment. When I start comparing myself to everyone around me, and I start thinking about how, how they can do this, or they can do that, and I can't do this, and I, I'm never going to be happy with who God's created me to be. I need to accept the fact that God's created me in his likeness and his image, and he's asking me to live out my journey, not anyone else's. And that's why it's so important for us to recognize how God does display his power in our lives. As we're thinking about what that means, Ephesians chapter 1 says it this way, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened 
that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards those of us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Paul is talking to the church and talking to us about how God's power is constantly at work in us. That there's never a time and there's never a moment and there's never a place where you can go that's beyond God's power working in you. And on this Father's Day, as we celebrate what that means, we can know that regardless of our circumstances, regardless of where we're at, God's power is at work in us. And we look at the things going on around us and we say, God, we need divine intervention because this is beyond our ability to solve. And we look at the people, <clears throat> pardon me, who are living with the greed and the avarice and the lust and the envy and all the things that come along with wanting power. And we say, God, help us not to live like that. Help us not to be about acquiring power and protecting power. But help us to be about being people of God who celebrate your power at work within us. The resurrection power that brought Jesus from the grave is the same resurrection power that lives in us and transforms us right now into the people that God so loves and so cherishes. What an amazing journey we are on this morning of thanking God and praising God in this final part of this prayer for his power at work in his creation. I was reading a story this week about a man in northern India and according to the world records of the different people who keep track of this that's known right now, and maybe in centuries past someone else has beat this record, but as it stands right now, this past week, the man with the largest family in the world passed away. This past week, at 78 years old, this gentleman in northern India passed away. He had a huge four-story complex built of over a hundred rooms in this poor, desolate part of India. He painted the whole thing this purple color that can be seen for miles on this hillside. He, has 90, he had 96 children from 39 wives. <laughs> Now, I'm just going to let that sit there. I'm not going to add any comments to that. I'm not going to elaborate on anything. I'm just going to say he thought that he controlled. He thought that he was in charge. He thought, and they, I watched interviews with him and his thinking and processing about how that worked. But here's the interesting thing. They identified as Christians. And he is the leader of that small sect of people who believes in polygamy. And there were crosses and scriptures and all kinds of things everywhere. And I thought to myself, how far off track we can get in our journey of faith sometimes. And what we think we're accomplishing now, I don't know what he thought he was accomplishing by marrying 39 ladies and having 96 children. But in some ways, in my own mind, I can get just as sidetracked as that. Maybe not with 39 wives, but maybe with the messages that the culture we live in is constantly giving us and telling us about who we are and what we should be and how we should live and how we should think, <coughs> pardon me, how we should think about who we are. The messages that we get from this culture that try to define for us what power looks like and what we should strive to control as well. 
There are schemes being thought of and planned out and traps being prepared right now for the people of God to get us sidetracked, to get us off track. And as men especially, there's a spirit of restlessness that the enemy wants to bring us about what we are and how we live and what that's supposed to look like. There's a movie that came out a number of years ago called City Slickers. And in this movie, there's this one picture, this image of Billy Crystal, one of the lead actors in the movie. And he's talking about going through his midlife <coughs> crisis. This whole movie is about these men that have been getting together since young men and going on vacations every year. And now as their vacations have, have kind of got into the middle age, they're going out onto this dude ranch out in the middle of nowhere. And they're all going to get on horses. And they're going to ride. And they're going to drive cattle. And they're going to be cowboys for a week. And that's going to be their vacation. And there's this line in the movie where Billy Crystal is standing in front of the mirror at his house. And he's in that middle-aged part of his life. And he's looking in the mirror, and he's saying to the mirror, have you ever got up and looked in the mirror and said to yourself, this is as good as it's ever going to get, and it ain't that great? <laughs> <laughs> you see, <clears throat> as we think about who we are, <clears throat> and we're trying to acquire power and protect power, we see that so much lived out in our culture. As people try to retain the power and beauty of youth in all the different ways that people try to do that. As we strive and look towards the perfections of beauty that we put out there, as we look at the value of people around us based on their ability to help us or do something for us. As we look at the cultures that are working together in this great country to form a more perfect union and all the different colors of the rainbow that that represents in not only skin tone, but in attitudes and hearts and lives and experience. And thinking about how we live with the power that God has given us to affect change in this world. And Ephesians chapter 6 says it this way, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It's not by our might or by our power by how many wives we marry, or how many kids we have, or how much money's in the bank. It's in how we live our lives with the true source of power, the power that works within us each day to transform us into the person that God wants us to be. How do you see God's power at work in your life? Are you buying into the myths of power that the world around us tells us that you're the source of power. And once you acquire that power, it'll be permanent to you. And then ultimately, you're the one that's going to be able to control that and live that out. Because who you are is what you have the power to do and to accomplish. If those myths are lived out in your life, then you're always going to be searching for the next thing. A little bit more. You're never going to be happy with who God has made you, you're always going to be comparing yourself to someone else and thinking, if I was just like them. I watched a YouTube video recently about uh, a car called the Brooklyns. I know you guys have probably never heard of the Brooklyns, but it came out in 2009. It was the top of the line Bentley of the year. And that year, that particular car was $400,000. And as the guy was talking about the car, he was looking at it. It's this beautiful purplish blue hue. And you look inside. The door, it's, it's a coupe, but the door is so big. You guys will like this. 
the door is so big and so long that the people in the back seat have a, another handle to reach out so they can grab the door and open it from the back seat. There's two handles on the door, even though it's just one door. I've never seen a door that big with two handles on it for a coupe. But that's what you get when you get a $400,000 car. The inside was immaculate and perfect. But on, on the door panel, when you open it up, on the, on the, on the uh, aluminum door panel, when you open it up, the person who had originally bought the car had his name engraved on the door seal, the door sill of the car, where it said, made by Bentley Brooklyn's for, and it said his name, and I won't say his name even though I can tell you what it is, on the door sill of his car. So every time he got in his car, he could be reminded that this car was made for him. His car, not anybody else's, his car. And I thought about the check that he wrote or however he paid for that. And I thought about the wealth that that represented. And I thought about the power that he must have felt when he opened his door, saw his name there, got in the car, and drove to wherever he was going. I don't know how he drives a $500,000, $400,000 car to the grocery store. Where would he go where he would be seen for the wealth that he's had for this? Does he go to... Where does he go? What does he look like? What is he thinking when he's driving that car? What does that mean to him? What does that represent to him about who he is and what he is? Now am I saying that he was wrong to get his name engraved on a $400,000 car and drive that to the grocery? I'm not saying that. I'm asking us to think about what we value and how we value it. I would love for Bentley to stay in business for another 100 years. Please don't think I'm saying that there's anything wrong about people buying fancy cars. I'm talking about what we place our value on. And despite any initials you may put on anything you own, in spite of anything that you may put on those things that you value to claim it as your own personal possession, it ultimately passes on to someone else. You do not control it. But the one thing that doesn't pass away, and the one thing that you can depend on, is God's name for you. That he has stamped on your soul from the beginning of time, and when you get to heaven, there's going to be a little white stone that's given to you with the name God has stamped on you from before creation began. And that's the only name that matters. Because God has uniquely given you the power to think, to breathe, that your heart beats on its own, and everything about you that's being controlled right now is not coming from you. Stop your heart beating right now. Stop it. Not that you want to. Hold your breath and see how long you can last. What do you actually control? What are you in charge of? What is the source of your power? Is it you? The answer is no. The answer is God is the source of our power. And it's his kingdom. And it's his power. And it's his glory forever. And that's what we celebrate on this Father's Day. That God is omnipotent and all-powerful. That he's working within us. That we, even though we may not have the power to do the things that we would always want to see done, Philippians chapter 4 says we are able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So realign and transform through putting your life in such a way that you can align with the things that God wants you to be and that God wants you to do. And on this Father's Day, remember the source of our power. I uh, was listening to, early in the service, those of you who may not be able to see the whole service that are online, and this makes it very personal to us. I was listening to Rose talk about Rick, and uh, she's already said this from the platform in this service, so I can share it with you, I think. 
And that is, uh, she talked about Rick's role as a stepdad and what that means and what that looks like. I was also raised by a stepdad. I had a Joseph in my life who raised me. And if I can point back in my spiritual journey to anyone who helped me to have the strength and the power to stand here today, it's him. I wasn't his biological son, but yet he raised me as if I was. And showed me the path of righteousness and what that looks like. And I know we live in a world of broken homes and broken families, of imperfect fathers and imperfect situations. But I can tell you this, as men of God, when we tap into the source of God's power, he can help us as men to do things beyond our ability to do. And to be men that affect change for generations to come. And more than just a name on a door sill of a $400,000 car. The memories that are eternal, that burn their way into the legacy of God's plan for this world. As heroes of the faith, we take a stand for what is right and for what is good and for what is noble and for what is pure. Count me in. Count us in. Count Hope Church in. That's who we are. That's who we want to be. That's the kind of men we want to have in this church and in this community and in this world as we celebrate together what it means to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray and the power. Would you stand together with me as we close our service today? And I'd like for us, if we would, as we close our service today, to close with the prayer that I've been quoting and that Jesus has taught us to pray. Would you bow your heads together with me? For those of you that know the prayer, please join me as I pray together by saying it out loud together with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Happy Father's Day.